This video is brought to you by Skillshare. When it comes to renewable energy, solar, wind, and hydro keep coming up as number one. But what about number two? Literally. And I'm talking about, <laughs> well, poop. There's a rich carbon neutral resource that we could tap into, turning crap into energy instead of flushing it down the toilet. It could be used as a coal alternative to sequester carbon, strengthen concrete, and more. There's an old technology that's starting to make a splash and might change the way you think about number two. Let's see if we can come to a decision on turning waste into energy and if it's worth it. I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecided. We're always looking for clean energy in any source we can. Solar, wind, crops, even the currents at the bottom of the sea. Trying to get more and more creative to find something that really stands out. A couple of months ago, a fan of the channel put me in contact with a company that's doing just that in a way I was not expecting. What if we could turn good old number two into a resource for generating energy and producing products that we use every single day, all while cleaning up the environment? Sounds like an idea that doesn't stink. This was a topic right up my alley. Now, usually we're talking about new technologies, but this tech has been around since 1913. So what gives? Why are we still literally flushing away renewable energy instead of taking recycling to a whole new level? Now, I'd argue that there are three unavoidable things in this world, death, taxes, and bathroom breaks. It doesn't matter how much you hate creating waste, even the most hardcore recycler has to go sometime. Everybody poops. Now, I'm gonna go out on a limb and guess that the vast majority of you haven't given much thought to what happens to your waste after you flush. I know I hadn't. Now, the trip to the porcelain throne is just the beginning. After our waste travels through the sewage system to the wastewater treatment plant, they separate the solids from the water. In rural areas, it travels to a septic tank where the water leaches out and the sludge is removed to be treated elsewhere. The water is treated through an intensive process before being discharged into local bodies of water. The leftover solids get taken care of in one of three ways. You can incinerate it, which is pretty much what it sounds like. You burn it. Now all those materials and its energy literally go up in smoke and into our atmosphere. The second way is to landfill it. In the landfill, those biosolids break down into methane and CO2, depending on whether oxygen is present. If there is no oxygen, anaerobic digestion takes place, generating CO2 and methane. If there is oxygen present, aerobic digestion occurs, generating CO2. The third way and the most common is to apply those biosolids to agricultural fields. About 50% of biosolids produced in the US are used for agriculture to grow products for animal feed. So human waste is used to grow products to feed farm animals like dairy cows. The problem with sewage management is that it never stops. Everybody poops about a pound per day, give or take. Multiply that by several billion people, 365 days a year, and you can start to get a sense of the magnitude of the problem. In the US alone, we produce an estimated five to 13 dry tons of sewage sludge. That's human waste, which is generally 25% solid. Add the water content, and that's billions of gallons of waste every single year, and it's never going to stop. Even after treatment, the final biosolids can still have contaminant issues. And to put this politely, sometimes things come out the same way they went in. And this doesn't just mean corn, it also includes things like detergents, microplastics, pharmaceuticals, and forever chemicals like PFAS. Now this becomes an even bigger problem when these solids are reused for fertilizer because those contaminants are put right back into the crops and the cycle continues. Multiple dairy farms in Maine have already had to close production because their milk had high levels of PFAS, leading to a loss of income and public trust. Now, as you can imagine, this type of waste isn't great for the environment either. The water content is usually treated and discharged into water bodies, but if the water isn't treated properly, the solids, metals, and other contaminants can choke out wildlife habitats and fisheries. The waste is nutrient rich. If it's dumped in a lake without treatment, it can lead to overgrowth of certain bacteria and algae, which can also disrupt the natural habitat of aquatic life. Then there's the energy consumption part of this to consider. Wastewater treatment plants are estimated to consume more than 30 terawatt hours per year of electricity, and that's about $2 billion in annual electric costs. And that's likely not from very clean sources. Electricity usually takes up about 25 to 40% of wastewater treatment plants annual budget. And those needs are likely to rise with population growth and tightening water quality requirements. Biosolids also have a greenhouse gas problem. As I mentioned before, they break down in the landfill to methane and CO2. The problem there is that methane is 25 times more potent than CO2 as a greenhouse gas, although it does have a shorter lifespan. Municipal solid waste landfills are the third largest source of human related methane emissions in the US. Throughout history, humans have simply moved bowel movements out of sight and out of smell range. And some of these sewage disposal methods have been in practice for nearly 100 years, mostly because nobody's come up with a better way to deal with poop. There's gotta be a better way. And that's where this old 1913 technology comes in, 
and the company that's taking this old idea and commercializing it to innovate and change their entire business model. Before we get to that and relate it directly to it, if you wanna learn how to innovate and set your company or business apart, you might wanna check out the Creative Business Model Innovation class at Skillshare. If you're anything like me, then you like learning new things. Skillshare has built an incredible online learning community with thousands of classes to learn new skills and a wide array of topics. For me, I've been trying to optimize how I work and to be more productive. And one of the classes I found super helpful is Thomas Frank's Real Productivity, How to Build Habits That Last. I often have too many things I wanna do and get done. And it's helped me to set clear goals. Everything on Skillshare is focused on learning, so there aren't any ads, they're always launching new premium classes, and every time I log in, I see something new that I wanna watch and learn from. And for the non-English speakers out there, the entire catalog is available with subtitles in multiple languages. The first 1,000 people to use the link or my code undecided with Matt Farrell will get a one month free trial of Skillshare. Thanks to Skillshare and to all of you for supporting the channel. Now back to this old technology that's being used to change an industry. Hydrothermal carbonization, also known as subcritical water, or hot compressed water carbonization. It was first identified in 1913 by German Nobel Prize chemist, Dr. Burgess. However, right after this find, the 20th century had other plans for Germany, including a world war, the rise of Nazism, another world war, the breakup of a wall, and reunification of East and West Germany. With all this turmoil, it wasn't until 2006 that it got its foothold at Max Planck Institute for Colloidal Science in Potsdam, Germany. This waste management alternative has been seeing a surge in popularity in recent years, I had a chance to talk to Dan Spracklin from Somax, where they're commercializing the technology. What hydrothermal carbonization, or HTC, is, essentially the most simple way of thinking about it is an industrial-sized pressure cooker. But it runs continuously, so it's not like uh, you would have at home where you have maybe cooking some chicken in a pressure cooker or a crock pot where you do it in a batch. We do it consistently. And so what happens is we apply heat and pressure to the material. Applying pressure, puts water into a subcritical state. When you put water into a subcritical state, that means it starts to boil, but the pressure won't let it turn into steam. This all happens with 10 to 50 bars of pressure at about 180 to 250 degrees Celsius. This is the perfect temperature to have that water act as a reagent, meaning it sets off a whole chain of chemical reactions which separate the larger molecules in the mix. What we're doing essentially is taking large molecules, first we chop them up, and then we pull off some oxygen atoms and some hydrogen atoms to make a more stable compound and smaller molecules. And then the last step is we recombine those molecules to make useful products. And those products are essentially coal. So we're mimicking the way that mother nature formed coal. Typically earth does it over a period of hundreds of millions of years. So coal is typically about 250 to 360 million years in formation. And we're able to do this with sewage sludge in less than an hour. The resulting product doesn't just look like coal, it can actually be used as a coal alternative. The fuel value is similar to that of lignite coal, and treatment plants have been using these solids to co-fire in coal handling infrastructure. And in spite of its origins, the high temperature has killed all bacteria and other biological threats, making the new fuel sanitary. As part of this process, the solid phase of HTC produces a liquor-rich process water as a byproduct that is chock full of VOCs, formic acid, acetic acid, phenols, and other fun derivatives. Yum. So what do we do with this HTC process liquid? Well, this is where it gets exciting. This process liquid can be used alongside anaerobic digestion to produce biogas. That's right, this liquor byproduct can be used as a fuel in itself. This is why HTC has been suggested as an intermediate step for producing biodiesel. Certain governments, including Germany and Italy, heavily subsidize the practice of generating biogas from wastewater plants. Europe's biogas production from industrial and urban sewage sludge increased by 40% between 2013 and 2017. So how much energy can you actually get from this, and does it actually balance out with the energy needed to make it happen? As with everything, it depends. When it comes to sewage in particular, HTC shows some strong energy potential. The energy required of the sewage sludge's drying process is reduced by up to 62% from normal drying techniques. And traditionally, wastewater treatment plants consume a tremendous amount of energy, and that's a huge chunk of their operating cost. Those savings can add up quickly. Some studies even say that the economic benefit from the hydrochar production for energy recovery has exceeded the profits from biogas production per ton of sewage sludge. Now translated, the plant can produce more biogas, possibly up to 5%, while saving on energy costs. The best part, the source of energy is always plentiful. You don't have to wait for the sun to shine or the wind to blow to collect that energy. You can treat waste 24 seven, 365 days a year, and the material will never stop flowing. You can also make some pretty cool things from the HTC process besides coal and biogas. 
there's some diamonds to find in the roughage here. Now, one promising application is to replace sand and concrete with the solid products of HTC. The construction industry is already infamous for their negative environmental impacts. They contribute a whopping 40% of the world's energy-related CO2 emissions. Part of that is because they require a ton of virgin materials to produce things like brick and concrete. By using the solid products of HTC, they no longer need to mine these materials. In 2019, engineers from Australia's Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology tested bricks made up of 25% biosolids and found that these hybrids cut down energy use by nearly half during the firing process. Companies just like Somax are working with sewage sludge to replace sand in concrete mixes. At just 10% replacement, you could offset all of the emissions from cement production. We're not just recycling here either. Incorporating biosolids into construction materials is a powerful carbon sequestration tool. These companies can use biosolids to offset sand consumption while also sequestering the carbon from the biosolids for thousands of years in the concrete. You can break it, reuse it, toss it. No matter what, the CO2 isn't going to come magically back out. Also remember that biosolid fertilizer problem that I mentioned earlier? With HTC in the mix, you can create a carbon neutral fertilizer from that hydrochar. Only this time, you can get rid of that pesky PFAS. This is no small feat because PFAS is called the forever chemical for a reason. They're made up of carbon fluorine bonds, which are one of the strongest bonds around. That makes it great for weather resistant clothing and Teflon, but not so much for the environment. But for HTC, it doesn't give a crap. You're breaking those molecules apart and getting rid of those potential harmful pollutants at the same time with some energy generation to boot. That pollutant destroying aspect of HTC is also making it a good candidate for making another important resource, <laughs> drinking water. Now just hear me out here. HTC is creating a carbon product, so you can activate it chemically or thermally, which opens up the pores to filtration, which means we can have activated carbon, which is a crucial product of filtering drinking water. Now remember, HTC is literally tearing molecules apart and sticking them back together. On a chemical level, the end product is no different from what you started with. It's essentially a giant autoclave. And that's what we're essentially doing is acting as a large autoclave. So I would never do this and grab, you know, sewage sludge or biosolids, but I have no problem going and grabbing hydrochar, smelling it, you know. Uh, I don't recommend eating it. It won't, do, won't kill you, but I'm sure it doesn't taste well. Um, but yeah, it's completely safe material. Depending on what you use for feedstock, HTC can pretty much make everything from supercapacitor materials to anode materials for fuel cells, to energy, to syngas, to steel, to concrete and cement. The general process is the same. Toss it in, cook it, and bam. At the end, you have carbon. It's like the world's largest and grossest easy bake oven. An economic study in Switzerland found that the HTC treatment per dry ton of digested sewage sludge with industrial sized plants cost about six to $700, which compares to current sewage sludge treatment costs of about 660 to $1,000. Similar studies in Germany reported that HTC reduces the cost involved in sludge treatment and disposal. Treating biosolids with HTC can not only reduce energy costs, but at the end of it, you literally have less crap that you need to get rid of, which really puts a dent in those operational costs. Somax has seen these energy savings firsthand. In the case of our project in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania, we're able to produce 153% of the energy demand of that treatment plant. So it goes from being the largest consumer of energy in that municipality to a net energy producer. And we're gonna produce 153% of the energy demand that extra energy is going back out onto the grid to run things like city hall, street lights, stoplights. It'll run the police station and the fire station and provide them with electricity 24 seven. So if this is such a great system, why haven't we been hearing more about it? Besides the fact we're talking about blue. Now Google the studies on HTC and you'll soon see how much has exploded across academia in the past few years. However, the lab scale applications are still catching up to real life applications and with it, the real life funding. It has not attracted the investment that, say, oil and gaskets or other, you know, solar, you know, you're not seeing hundreds of billions of dollars invested in this because A, the investors don't know, B, even the so-called sustainability or carbon experts aren't aware of this process because it hasn't really made its way out of academia into the real world. And by building this plant in Pennsylvania, the first one in North America, we're bringing it out into the world to make people aware of it. So this was to us, you know, it's really a coming out party. We've been operating in stealth mode until October of last year, when there was a public announcement that our technology was selected by the U.S. Department of Energy as the technology that should be implemented at small and medium wastewater treatment plants across the country. While HTC has a lot of technical aspects to consider, 
The biggest challenge right now may actually be regulatory. Remember, this isn't just a plumbing issue. It's a public health issue. HTC requires biomass, and biomass comes with quite a bit of red tape. This red tape is due to the fact that poop is a biohazard and can harbor disease. But the legal paperwork can take years to process. So even we've got the stamp approval from the U.S. Department of Energy to implement this, this process at wastewater treatment plants across the United States. In Pennsylvania, it's taken us three years to get the permit to even try this process out at a wastewater treatment plant. If you tell people about the environmental value, back it up with the economic benefits, and have leaders lead by example, that's when the magic happens. It may not be polite conversation, but talking about the literal power of crap is the first step. If you're still surprised by biosolids and how much they can do, you're not alone. Just ask Dan. One of the final questions I do want to ask you is kind of like, uh, what is the, one of the most surprising things about this type of work in your experience? Like, what, what is the most thing that's caught you kind of off guard that you weren't expecting? Is there anything? The, the most surprising thing is that everything works. So we, you know, <laughs> we have a little little game we play with our in our lab here. Is on Wednesday we we, we have a will it carbonize Wednesday, and so we just take off the wall things and say will it carbonize. So I brought in some t-shirts that said they you know they had holes in them and stuff. So we cut up the t-shirts. We put it through this process. Guess what? They carbonize. So it's everything from macadamia nuts to sunflower seeds to, um, you know, flowers themselves. We've actually processed flowers whole and even, you know, carcasses. So the neat, neat thing about that is the whole thing will carbonize. The, the bones will remain the shape, but once you touch the bone, it just goes into powder. So huge surprises for me about were, were about the raw sludge converted into hydrochar, actually how well it acted as an activated carbon to filter out pollutants. That was surprising to me. I thought, you know, that will never work, but yeah, it did. For me, the decision seems pretty clear. HTC is a great two birds, one stone solution. We have to deal with our crap, literally. <laughs> Why not get some extra use out of it? Academia and industry leaders like Dan Spracklin agree. This tech has the potential to make a difference now. The question seems to be how to get over that gulf between the theoretical and full scale application. Simply put, it may be time to carbonize or get off the pot. So are you still undecided? What do you think about HTC and poop power? Is it number one or is still number two? Jump in the comments and let me know. If you have knowledge of this or you work in the industry, please share your experience so we can learn more together. And thanks as always to my patrons. All of your direct support really helps with producing these videos and to reduce my dependence on the almighty YouTube algorithm. And speaking of which, be sure to check out one of these videos over here and subscribe and hit that notification bell if you think I've earned it. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.